started. All right. Good morning, officially. Welcome to Monday, everyone's favorite day of the week. Maybe? No. No? Yeah, Monday's always a little... Monday's a little rough, right? Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you're here. Welcome to Monday. Um, anybody doing anything fun on the weekend? Anyone doing any fun? Morning, Mike. Anything fun? Just like seeing uh, the downtown. Just seeing what? Okay. So, so yeah, that's fun. Was, yeah, it was a little wet. It was a little wet on Saturday, but yeah, still nice. Anyone else? Anything fun? It's so fun you can't actually tell me about it. It's like illegal. <laughs> What's Netflix? What's that? Netflix. Netflix. Netflix? Yeah. That that was that was the weekend? Yeah. Netflix was the weekend. Um yeah, I cleaned my shower yesterday. That was super exciting. OK, anyway, uh, let's say hi to Vito. Vito's here. Good morning to you. And we'll jump back into where we were. Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, so on Friday, we had talked about, um, we had gone through all of these kind of aspects of culture, right? We said culture was symbolic, right? Humans communicate with each other in a uh, kind of a, a, in a very symbolic way in a lot of different kind of contexts. We said that culture is learned, right? That people go through an enculturation process basically through their whole lives, learning cultural symbols and meanings and customs and behavior. And of course those change, right, over time. Things that we used to do, we don't do anymore, right? And things that we're, you know, going to do tomorrow, you know, we, we adapt, right? So. You know, the wearing of masks, of course, is a new thing for most of us here in Canada, but we've kind of adapted to it, right? It's becoming, well, I guess it remains to be seen if it'll become part of culture or not, right? But, um, but culture is constantly learned, right? And all the way from when we're born, because we don't really have any programming, we don't have any culture, all the way to um, until we die, almost. We said culture is integrated, so all the different parts of culture are connected to one another. Good morning. What you looking for? Oh, now they're right. Okay. Good luck. There you go. Um, so culture is integrated. So the cultural parts of, or the economic parts of culture, the social, the political, the religious, uh, the familial, if you will, families, all of those things are connected to each other, right? And if one thing changes, all the other things in culture have to kind of move and adjust, right? And the last one, culture is shared, right? Which is something that people do together. Um, now, we were starting to talk about ethnocentrism and cultural relativism on Friday. And if you'll recall, we were talking about the Aztecs, right? Who are an indigenous people from um, what's now Mexico. Um, they lived there kind of from, I think, the 12 or 1300s through to the 1500s. Unfortunately, they have a, an unfortunate end to, their, to the high point of their culture when Cortez, a Spanish explorer, comes along and destroys the city and sort of scatters the Aztecs you know, throughout Mexico. Um, we said that the Aztecs had built a, a fantastic city on top of a lake, right? That may have looked something like this. Um, again, they, when they arrived in the region, the cultures that were already there didn't really like them very much and didn't want to give them any land. And so the Aztecs were kind of forced to build their own, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, so we, we looked at a few pictures of what this city might have looked like. And then we kind of imagined that we could go back in time with the Tony Stark space-time GPS, go back in time and just see what it would have been like. And as I was kind of describing that to you, I described a human sacrifice in which people's hearts were sacrificed to the sun god. And I think we agreed it was a pretty brutal process, right? Keep in mind the victims of sacrifice were still alive and 
their hearts were probably still beating outside their body, which is gross and disgusting and crazy, right? But, um, and then of course we said that the, the, the bodies of those sacrificial victims were often taken away by the warriors that originally captured them uh, and sometimes sent off to other Aztecs and, and sometimes consumed, sometimes eaten. I forget who it was, somebody online, maybe it was Vito, pointed out that the guy in the pot looks like he's smiling a little bit. I don't know why, I don't know how much he has to smile about, but um, I don't know. Um, but but this, was a, this was a cultural practice of the time. And I asked you, of course, you know, how, how should we feel about this, right? Or how, how would you feel about it? And some people said that they would feel scared, some people said that they would feel scared. Some people said that they would feel, uh, you know, kind of grossed out or that they would want to run away or uh, Felicia said, well, she's curious, right? And, and I'm curious too, but I think I would want to get out of there, right? Because I certainly wouldn't want to be, I certainly wouldn't want to be sacrificed next, right? Um, so again, this is a very different practice from our own. And, to our eyes, I'm sure it would probably look barbaric and frightening and awful, right? But again, as good anthropologists, we want to not only, you know, look at cultural practices, but understand why they exist and, and just what is going on here, right? Is this a gory, bloody murder or is something else, something else happening? Um, and so really what we're talking about here is these two terms, ethnocentrism and cultural relativism. So when you're being ethnocentric, you are judging somebody else's culture based on the values of your own, okay? And so this is, you know, as an anthropologist, this is usually not what we want to do, right? Usually anthropologists are not judging cultures, they're not evaluating them, uh, although a couple hundred years ago they would have, but Nowadays, we're just trying to describe and understand, right? And so we don't want to be judging culture by the standards of our own, right? Because we do things for particular reasons, right? We've given, good morning, we've given certain meaning to the things that we do, but we're also, good morning, but other people do things for different meanings, right? I'll let you guys get settled there and then I'll continue, okay? So find yourself a seat wherever you like. So that's... So that's ethnocentrism. Cultural relativism is different though, right? Cultural relativism is where we suspend judgment. We try to understand cultures based on their own terms, right? Based on the things that they believe. And so, again, as good anthropologists, let's, let's try this with the Aztecs, right? So let me give you, again, a little bit of context, a little bit of background, okay? So for the Aztecs, the sun god, this is what the sun god has to do, okay? So during the day, the sun, of course, moves across the sky, right? And then at night, it goes below the horizon, right? And things get dark. And when the sun goes below the horizon, what's happening is that the sun god is entering the underworld, okay? And in the underworld, uh, it, the underworld is filled with all kinds of dangerous monsters and creatures. And they're trying to kill the sun god. And so the sun god has to fight his way through the underworld, trying to defeat these fearsome monsters and creatures so that again he can rise the next day, right? Now as it turns out, in Aztec mythology and Aztec religion, um, blood, human blood, is actually what the gods eat, okay? This is food for the gods. The things that, the stuff that's flowing through your veins, that is sacred sustenance for the gods, right? And so the sun god here, the Aztecs are trying to help him, right? 
They're trying to feed him so that he can be strong and fight his way through the underworld and rise the next day. Because whether you're Aztec or not, if the sun doesn't come up tomorrow, we're all in big trouble, right? Yeah, <laughs> the sun doesn't rise tomorrow, we're all in big trouble. So the Aztecs are trying to do just that. They're trying to ensure that the sun rises. And so they try to feed the sun god with, um, with, with human blood. And in fact, they were so kind of committed to this idea of human blood as being sacred that they actually tried not to kill people except in this context. So if they were having a war with you know, the people around them, which they often did, because I said the cultures around them didn't really like them very much, the Aztecs would try to capture these people and not kill them. And what they found, interestingly, was when the Spanish came, the Spanish came looking for riches, right? They were looking for wealth. Uh, particularly, they were looking for gold. And as it turned out, the Aztecs had quite a bit of gold. Um, also, interestingly, the Aztecs didn't really think it was that, um, they didn't really value it that much. Um, gold is kind of nice to look at, right? It doesn't really tarnish, but it's soft, right? It's a soft metal. You can't really make tools out of it. If you have a gold knife, it'll go dull really quickly because it's, it's just not, it's not a super useful metal in that way. Um, so the Aztecs had lots of gold. They thought it was pretty, but they didn't really think much of it. But of course, the Spanish did, right? The Spanish saw this gold and their, you know, they had little dollar signs in their eyes, just like in the cartoons, right? And so the Spanish, of course, were there to take, right? They were there to loot. And so they would get in conflicts with the Aztecs and with other people in the area, and they would shoot them, right, with their very old time muskets, right, that they had. And they would shoot these people and take their gold, right? And the Aztecs would see this and say, you know, this is, this is horrible, right? This is barbaric. They're killing these people, you know, this sacred human life, this sacred human blood, and they're just leaving these people, you know, dead, right? And so what a horrible waste of human life was what the Aztecs were thinking. And of course, the Spanish were thinking something similar, right? Because they saw the same ritual that I explained to you, right? Of the cutting and the heart. And the Spanish thought, good morning. Good morning. And the Spanish thought, what a, look at these barbarians. What an awful waste of human life, right? Which is ironic because when we look at it, both of these cultures are kind of valuing the same thing, right? Both of them feel that human life is sacred, right? But there's different rules around when blood is to be spilled, right? When is it okay to kill someone? For the Aztecs, it's okay to kill someone if you are feeding the sun god, right? If you are sacrificing them to the gods. For the Spanish, it's okay to kill people if you want to take their stuff, and particularly if they're not Spanish. Right? Then it doesn't count. Sorry, I'm being a, little, being a little silly there, but that's kind of what the Spanish felt. Right? But both of them had the same value, that human life was sacred, but they had kind of different, um, they had different boundaries around that rule. Right? Who, who can be killed and when? Right? What about in society today? What's our rule for who can be killed and when? That's, that's the rule of our society? I hope not. I better hit the gym otherwise. <laughs> In the past, okay, it could have been, could have been the strong. That's certainly the, the law of nature, right, is that the, the strong can kill the weak. But what's our, what's our rule today in sort of modern societies? What's that? Okay, so people may be killed in, in war, right, in conflicts. Um, Usually only in certain ways, though, right? So you're not, allowed, you're not supposed to use biological agents. You're not supposed to use chemical warfare. Some people still do, but you're not supposed to, right? 
So in war, we can kill people. When else can we kill people? When what? Okay, so if a, if a criminal, if we have a really bad criminal and they are sentenced to be executed, right, the state can kill that person, right? Individual people aren't allowed to kill people, but the state can kill people if they're sentenced to a, a crime, right? Anything else? What's that? Oh, okay, yeah, so um, I can't speak for all of your countries, of course, but here in Canada, we are just starting to take steps about um, medically assisted dying, right? So if you're in a coma, if you're never going to wake up, or if, you're, if you have a disease that's very painful and you're going to die anyway, a doctor can help you to kind of die at your own time. <laughs> yeah. What do you, what? Come on, let me in on the joke. What? Yeah, they kind of help you out. But, but of course that's, you know, a lot of people struggle with this idea, right? Because some doctors are, you know, they feel that it's suicide and they, they feel that that's against their sort of values or against their religion. Some doctors are like, well, I'm supposed to help save people. I'm not supposed to kill them, right? That's not what I'm supposed to do. Um, some people, of course, are in favor. So it's, it's, still, um, it's still a somewhat controversial topic. But that's a, that's a way in which people may be killed in modern society too, depending on certain rules. But again, similar to the Aztecs and to the Spanish, we kind of have the same value. Right? Human life, human life is a sacred thing, and you can only end human life in certain circumstances. Right? The Spanish basically thought they were at war. Right? The Aztec thought they were, you know, um, honoring and feeding and supporting the god. Uh, and we, of course, feel that you know, unless you're in pain or you're not going to wake up, or if you're convicted of a crime, or if it's a war, those are the only circumstances in which people may be killed, right? And maybe sometimes by the police if, you know, certain things that we won't, we won't go there because that's a, that's a whole can of worms, right? Police violence is a whole other thing. Um, but, but, but it's the same, we have the same value, right? All of us cultures have the same value and yet we kind of express them differently or we put different boundaries around them. Um, yeah, so human life is sacred. If somebody's going to be killed, it can only happen for certain reasons or under certain conditions. And again, the gods are to be honored and obeyed, right? The Aztecs felt that. Do you think the Spanish felt that? The Spanish were, were Catholic. Do you think they felt that God should be honored and obeyed? Yeah, right? Not the same God as the Aztecs, but they felt they felt that same way, right? So it's very interesting how these two cultures probably looked at each other and thought, oh, awful, right? Awful, awful people. And yet they hold some of the same values and they hold the same values as we do, right? But again, there's different boundaries, right? There's different parameters around how these, how these things work. Right? And again, I'll just throw this in here. Um, for the Aztecs, most of the people who were sacrificed were war captives, right? They captured people from the area around and, and sort of sacrificed them. But, but sometimes, um, but sometimes an, an Aztec would be sacrificed themselves, right? And, and, what a, and what an honor it was, right, to be sacrificed. Because I don't know how many of you are, are religious in this room, but if you think about it, how often does a, a human being get to directly assist a god? Almost never, right? If you're thinking of like a Judeo-Christian background, we can never help God, right? God is supposed to help us all the time, right? We pray and, and maybe he'll help us out, but we can't really help him, right? We are powerless to help God. But here, the Aztecs are in fact not powerless, right? by their sacrifices, and maybe even by the giving of their own life, they can directly 
help the god, which is a huge thing, right? And so imagine the, imagine the honor of being able to, to do that, right? Imagine the honor of being able to directly give your life so that the sun god can be powerful, right? That'd be, that'd be huge, right? That'd be a huge amount of honor. Um, but again, what I want to point out here is similar values, right? These two were kind of looking at each other in an ethnocentric fashion, right? They were judging each other's culture by the values of their own. And of course, by the Spanish, according to Spanish values, yeah, the Aztecs are brutal, gory murderers, right? And by the Aztec uh, kind of culture, looking at the Spanish, they thought the same thing of the Spanish. Right? And so, and I think we did too, right? When I first described that, that ritual to you, probably your response was, ooh, like this is, these people are gory murderers, right? Not to mention that they're eating people. And I think there's some reports of like w them wearing human skin too, which is kind of, kind of, I'm probably not helping my point here, but, <laughs> but what I'm saying is sometimes similar values, right? We just need to understand them. Now, doesn't necessarily mean we need to agree with them. And I don't know if we'll be able to get into that in this class, maybe we can later, but just because we understand something doesn't we mean we need to agree with it, right? So here we can understand this sacrifice to the gods, but we don't have to say that it's okay, right? And again, the sort of, this doesn't happen anymore, obviously, but just because we understand something doesn't mean it's okay. But our first step is to try to understand what's going on, okay? Um, yeah. Does that sound okay? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, okay. Let's leave that and let's move on to a first very short module on prehistory. And I kind of put this in here because I think there's a couple of things from, most of what we'll be looking at is, is from actual history. And what I'll, what I'll share with you maybe a little later in this week is the idea that history basically starts when people start writing things down, okay? And writing is incredibly important for anthropology and for historians because when people start to write things down, you can start to tell, you can start to understand what they think, right? What they believe, what they imagine to be true, right? But without that writing, we don't have, we don't know any of that, right? We can only guess, right? We can only guess what people are thinking and believing and feeling. And so most of the time we divide, um, you know, human history into prehistory and into history itself. History is where we have records of writing. Prehistory is where we have no writing at all. And, and writing is very recent. Right? Writing is only maybe 6,000 years old. Humans are about 300,000 years old. So prehistory is a long, long, long time. And most of our history as a species is in, is in prehistory, right? We, and we don't have written records for it. But I'll give you a very quick sort of overview of some of the things that we do know or that we're trying to figure out just to give us some context. And again, there's a few things I wanna pull from this, okay? So, we said that one of the things that makes humans unique and one of the things that's important for this course is the idea that humans have culture, right? And so, okay, but where does culture come from? Right? Why do we have culture and why do no other animals have it, okay? So, what we're looking at here is our, the evolution of us, right? The evolution of us as hominids right, as primates that walk on two feet, right? And really, there's not that many of us. Well, currently there are none, right? Uh, we are the only primate that walks on two feet, at least to get around normally. Other primates use all four feet to get around, right? Whether they're swinging in the trees or whether they're running on the ground, they usually use four feet. We are bipedal, we have two feet and we're the only one left. But 
If you go back millions of years, you'll find that there are other bipedal primates as well that come before us. Now, very quickly, there's no absolute picture of what happened, okay? We're talking about um, the story of us as primates that walk on two feet. That story goes back probably about four or five million years, okay? And we have a lot of information from that five million years, but there's also a lot that we are missing. And so the picture is very fuzzy. Um, Paleoanthropologists who work on this, they try to they, they try to sort of make a metaphor and they say, how many of you have done a puzzle? You know, like it's a picture of the mountains or something and you put all the pieces in, or maybe your grandparents have done them, right? So paleoanthropologists say, well, it's like doing a puzzle, except you're missing a bunch of the pieces, a bunch of the pieces are broken, and you don't have the top of the box, so you don't really know what the picture is. You're just trying to put together the pieces based on how well you think they fit together. And so that's what these people are doing. They are finding the remains of the bones of these animals, trying to put them together, and then trying to understand what they can tell us about the past. And it's, it's not an easy job. Right? It takes a lot of knowledge and study and it takes a long time to be able to pull little chunks of rock and bone out of the ground and say something about the animal that it came from. But, you know, every year we are making, you know, we're discovering things, we're finding out new, um, new things about our origins. So it's kind of an exciting field. Um, I'll show you this, and this is probably not accurate entirely. But it does show us kind of our family tree. And so all of the little names you see up here are different species of bipedal hominid. So they are primates like us, but they walked on two feet. Some of them might be our ancestors. Some of them might not be. Some of them definitely are not. Um, but over a span of about five million years or so, we see the development of the first primates that walked on two feet, all the way to things that look and feel and move just like we do, okay? Again, we're not gonna go through all of these, although that would be fun and exciting, but I actually, in university, I took a course that was actually entirely this. So it was hominid evolution. We did all of it for the entire course. It was really cool, but we don't have time for that. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of the highlights from this kind of family tree or this little uh, family history so that you have some idea of how this works, okay? Um, I'll show you this. This is probably, although not for certain, this is probably the first primate that walked on two feet, okay? And his name is, well, the, this might be a her too. Well, there were hers, there were hims and hers. The species is called Ardipithecus ramidus. You can see it there, that orange bar. So this species is living, you know, about five million years ago or so. And as you can see, it's something that's very different from you and I, right? Look how this, look how this creature is built, right? Compared to a modern human like us, it's very strange, right? Very much like an ape, right? It looks very much like an ape. Look at those hands, big hands, big long fingers, right? Those are great for swinging through the trees and for climbing, by the way. Nice long hands are good for that. Um, kind of short legs though, right? Their torso is really long. Their legs are kind of quite short. We'll see later on that long legs are good for walking long distances and so that will change, but these earlier creatures are kind of built more for the trees. Look how long their arms are. Their arms go right down to their knees. Those are long arms, right? Again, great for swinging through the trees. And look at their feet. This creature has a, a big toe that can grab onto things, right? Very strange, or at least very different from a modern human. So this is a creature, probably the first primate that walked on two feet probably didn't do it all the time though, 
right? It was probably spent a lot of its time climbing in the trees. Long arms, long fingers, you know, feet that can grab onto things, right? That's very useful in the trees. And so this animal's doing a little bit of both, right? Again, about five million years ago or so. But it looks like an ape. If you saw it in real life, it would look like a hairy ape, like we're used to seeing. And it probably has the intelligence of an ape as well, right? Not too smart. Well, you know, not by our standards anyway. But kind of a, you know, the first animal to start walking on two feet. Um, a little later, a little later we'll see creatures um, that are much better at walking on two feet. These two here are Australopithecus um, uh, species, maybe an Australopithecus afarensis. And they're much better at walking on two feet. Um, they have a number of different adaptations that have evolved since Artipithecus. These guys come a couple million years later. They have feet that look more like us. So their, their big toe is kind of more aligned with their foot. It doesn't, it doesn't grab anymore. Um, their legs are a little bit longer so more adapted to walking. Their arms are a little bit shorter. Um, there's more, but I won't go into it. Um, and you can see here, this is, um, this is from a museum, but it's kind of imagining a situation that actually happened. And so this was in a place uh, in, I think, Tanzania called Leitoli. And it was a place where I think three million years ago, a volcano erupted and it left a bunch of ash, like a layer of ash on the ground. And then these Australopithecus creatures walked through the ash. And then the, the ash got wet and it hardened and it basically turned into cement. And so we actually still have the footprints of these creatures in the rock. And you can see they're not using their hands or anything to move along. They're walking just on two feet like we do. And so here the, the people who have created the museum exhibit have kind of imagined a bit of a, you know, a pair, a, a male and a female Australopithecus walking along. Kind of maybe they're on a date. I don't know. I don't know if Australopithecus dated or not. Probably not. But <laughs> it's cute to imagine. Um, but again, we're, we're seeing you know, more um, adaptations that allow for better walking on two feet. Right? So this guy probably doesn't walk very far or very fast, probably looks very awkward. Um, Australopithecus probably walks a little more like we walk. Right? The, the, the way that they move would be still odd, right? still odd, but a little more human than the last. Um, so I'll, I'll show you this as well. There's some strange faces here. Um, we don't really know what these animals would have looked like because all we have are their skulls, right? So we can kind of, based on what we know about primate faces, we can kind of build in the muscles and kind of figure out how they might have looked based on their skulls. There's some science here, but there's also a bit of art trying to imagine, but it's, it's interesting to look, right, and to imagine that these, these were creatures that were around for, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, right? And at the time, they were probably the smartest animals on the planet, not nearly as smart as us, nowhere even close, but, um, but they survived, right? And, and again, some of them are, are our ancestors, right? They are... Um, sort of versions of, of human that came before. Right? And again, it's interesting to look into some of these in, into some of these faces, you know. Um, let me see. Oh yeah. That'll bring us to this person, not person, this species here, Homo habilis. And Homo habilis, as you can see, shows up around three million years ago. And they're important for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're the first member of our genus, right? So if 
you know anything about biology, species have two names, right? A genus and a species. Homo sapiens, that's us, right? Does anyone know any other biological names for things? Homo sapiens? What about your dog, your family dog? Any idea? They have a, they have a name. They're Canis familiaris, I think, right? Anybody have a cat? No cats? Felis, Felis domesticus, is, that's the cat species, right? So every species has a two-part name. And so this guy here, Homo habilis, he's part of our, or she, he or she, they, they're part of our family, right? They're part of our genus. And so Homo habilis shows up here around three million years ago with a bigger brain than all of those versions of hominids that came before, and a body that's a little more like us, right? So shorter arms, right? If you're gonna walk long distances, you don't want big long arms, right? That's pretty awkward. Longer legs, because longer legs are better for walking, right? They're more efficient. And a larger brain. Now. The important thing that Homo habilis is doing here, the reason why they're kind of important, has to do with this. And this, I'm sure you're going to be impressed with, this is the first tool in the history of Earth. This is the first tool ever made. So all of those tools that are on your desk right now, your phone, your pencil, your travel mug or your drink container, your earbuds, your watch, your clothing, all of those tools, this is the first tool ever invented. Impressive, yes? No? What's that? What is it used for? Excellent question, Quan. excellent question. Um, it does not look like much, right? It looks like something that you would see just sitting on the ground anywhere, right? Doesn't look like a tool. What is the point of this thing, right? Why is it a big idea? Well, here's why it's a big deal. Now, <coughs> Homo habilis was, the way that they got their food was, they just kind of scavenged around the environment for it. So they were probably eating all kinds of different things. They probably ate roots and fruits and nuts and seeds. They probably ate insects and grubs. Um, they probably ate basically anything that they could find. And that included stealing meat from the kills of larger animals, right? So keep in mind, hominids are evolving in Africa. There's all kinds of lions and leopards, or at least the distant ancestors of those creatures, killing animals. but Imagine, you know, these little hominids, right, these little homo habilis, you know, finding an animal that a lion has killed and basically seeing that, right? Not really a lot of meat left, right? The lions have pulled out all the organs in the middle, so that's gone. They've kind of taken the legs off of this animal. And really what's left, right? The ribs, the skin holding the ribs together and the head, right? Even this poor, this poor jackal's like, hey, there's nothing left, right? There's nothing for me. What am I supposed to eat, right? So of course, a homo habilis coming along would also see this and be like, ugh, there's no food here, right? But this is where the tool comes in because there is food left here. What's left that you can eat? Yeah the brain tissue is still there, right? So most of these animals, I think this was a wildebeest, but I'm not positive. Most of these animals have skulls that are too big that lions can't really get their mouth around it to crack it open, right? So the brain kind of stays stuck in there, and then, you know, beetles and worms and things will eat it later on. But along comes a little homo habilis, right? Homo habilis can break open the skull, and now it can access food that these other animals can't get at. 
right? The lions can't get at it. The jackals can't get at it. Only the little hominid with his tool can get in at it, right? And so suddenly Homo habilis has a new food source that other animals can't get to. And again, if you're, you know, if you're a living organism in an environment, that is very useful, right? To have access to food that no one else can access, right? Super useful, that's an advantage for you. And so the tool, that simple tool, gives Homo habilis an advantage. They can access this brain tissue. And I know it probably sounds gross to many of us, it certainly sounds gross to me, but food is food, right? And do you know what brain tissue is made of? No? Brain tissue, a lot of brain tissue, there's protein up there too, but a lot of brain tissue is fat. It's fatty acids is what it is. And a lot of what makes your brain tissue are omega-3 fatty acids. That's why you're told to sort of take omega-3s and eat you know, salmon and stuff like that because it's high in omega-3s because your brain's made out of it, right? That's why they're good for you. Uh, and here we have Homo habilis eating all of these omega threes, right? And so, is that? Do you think that's going to help their brain development? Yeah. Do you think that's going to help Homo habilis survive if he has access to food that no one else does? Yeah. Right. So this little this little tool here, not very impressive looking, but suddenly becomes very important, right? Uh, we, if you get the right type of stone, it'll spark, but um, hominids don't figure out fire for another um, probably two million years. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing is that, you know, think about how quickly technology changes now, right? Technology is changing at an incredible speed, but the further back you go, the slower technological change happens, right? And so... For these guys, innovations take millions of years, right? Even this, even this is, is two million years in the making. This simple tool, uh, which again, doesn't sound very impressive, but it is, right? It definitely helps Homo habilis um, access food. But the other thing it does, the other thing is it does is that it tells us something important about Homo habilis, right? So if you look, you can, find, you can find these if you know where to look in Africa, if you go to sort of places where you can um, access that layer of, of sediment. You can find lots of these. Homo habilis made tons and tons of them. And they made them for about a million years because Homo habilis was around for a million years, right? And if you look at them, they're all almost the same, right? They're the same kind of type of rock. They're round, they're about the same size, and they've knocked pieces of that rock off in almost the same way for a million years. And that's what's so interesting because what is that? Well, it tells us that they're passing that behavior down to their children, right? They're probably not verbally, right? They're probably not explaining it with language, but they're showing their kids how to do it, and their kids are learning. And those kids eventually show their kids and on and on and on for a million years, right? So this is the beginning of transmitting behavior, right? A sequence of steps to make this thing are then passed on to the next generation, right? And, and this is the very, very beginning of culture, right? The very, very beginning of behavior that is passed down, right? And of course, now, where we are now, we pass down huge amounts of behavior, right? How to act in public, how to treat your grandparents, how to eat a meal without, you know, eating like a pig, right? These are all things that we're taught as children. And this is the very beginning of it, right? the very beginning of teaching teaching behavior to the next generation, right? And so that's why, again, that little piece of stone is so exciting, right? Even though it's, in a way, it's not very impressive,
but in another way, it's very impressive, right? And Homo habilis will do this for a very, very long time, right? And again, as, as these kind of bipedal primates continue to evolve, we'll see that their behavior will become more complex, right? Their brains will continue to grow, their behavior will get more complex as well. They'll start to make new and more complicated tools, which I'll show you. Um, yeah, so here's probably, a, this is another museum exhibit, but you can see maybe, maybe what some homo habiluses used to look like, right? Again, we don't really know exactly what they would have looked like. We don't really know about their body hair situation either, if they were super hairy or if they were kind of less hairy like we are now. We don't really know those things, we're kind of just guessing. But it's interesting to think about them out there, you know, out there in the wilderness with their simple tools, somehow managing to survive and not be eaten by bigger, scarier things. Right? Um, yeah, let me see. Yeah, so this is kind of things that were things that became important to humans as this evolutionary process went on, right? The ability to walk on two feet, everything about us happens because we walk on two feet. Because when you do, that means you don't have to use these to walk around anymore, right? You can do other things with them. You can carry stuff, but you can also have very fine motor control, right? And so that's something that humans use, right? Making some of these tools, I'll show you some in a minute. Making some of these tools is not easy, right? You need a lot of skill and knowledge and you need careful control. You need careful motor control. And most animals don't have that, right? If you look at chimpanzees and, chimpanzees and gorillas, they don't have the sort of, you know, the small muscles and the sort of control to be able to, you know, play the piano for instance. Although I'd love to see a gorilla play the piano, wouldn't you? That'd be the highlight of my year. But they can't do it, not just because they're not smart enough, but their hands don't work the way ours do, right? So getting up on two feet allows our hands to start doing these things, right? And having free hands means you can make tools, right? Having to making tools means you can find new sources of food. And making those tools is also good for brain development as well, right? You're thinking about it. You're thinking, okay, if I hit it this way, it's gonna break this way. If I hit it this way, it'll break another way. How do I hit it so that I get the shape that I want, right? How do I hit it so that I get a nice sharp edge? These, these guys are thinking about this, you know, in very basic terms, because they're not that bright, but this is starting to happen, right? The brain is starting to build as we do these careful, creative exercises, right? Uh, humans also evolve a strong attachment system, right? And we see that happen whenever you take a baby away from its mother and it goes, it has a complete meltdown, right? That's our attachment system. Humans know that they depend on other humans from the very second they're born. Right? That's why baby doesn't want to be away from mom because one of the things that baby is wired with is that if you get separated from mom or dad, you're going to die. Right? You're, you don't know how to take care of yourself. You can't feed yourself. Without your attachment figure, whoever it is, you're going to die. Right? And of course, all of us humans have that. When we lose someone, right? when someone dies, we feel that. Right? When somebody breaks up with you, ooh, feel that, right? And that's, that's the attachment system, right? That's something that we evolved because humans depend on it. They depend on being attached to others. Um, so let me just see. Oh, okay. Um, yes, let's take a little break. When we come back, I'll just have something for you to read as a bit of a, an experiment to see how we are. But take a break, 10 minutes, come back and we'll do that, okay? Go, go do something bi bipedally <laughs> on two feet.
All right. So basically where we are, I've just, well, I haven't really taken you through it, but we've gone through about three million years of evolution here from primates that are first standing up on two feet all the way to primates with slightly bigger brains that are using tools, okay, homo habilis. Again, these are, you know, as compared to us, they're not very intelligent creatures, but again, they're probably the smartest creatures on the planet at the time, okay. Um, I was going to ask you, I am going to ask you to just read a, a section of the text here, a few pages, just because I want to, well, because I want you to. <laughs> it's, and it's important to, it's important to do. I have four questions for you here that have to do with some factors that might have led to these primates standing on two feet, right? Bipedalism is, bi is two and ped is foot, right? So bipedalism is two feet. Uh, how does climate affect the development of these creatures? Uh, how and why do our species, Homo sapiens, why do they leave Africa? They evolve in Africa, but then some of them leave, some of them stay behind, of course. Uh, and how and when do Homo sapiens populate the Americas? Okay. Four simple questions. Now, the textbook itself, this is, uh, is in Microsoft Teams. And so if you look under, um, where is it now? If you look under the Comparative Culture Team and you look under Files, you will see, you should see, a little folder that says World History Text. And if you click on that, then you'll see a PDF version of it inside. Okay? So I'll give you, I'll give you some time to read that. And I'm thinking, I'm going to put about 12 minutes on the clock. I'm going to put about 12 minutes on the clock. And then I'm hoping that will be enough time. And once we're done, we will... Um, We'll discuss the answers. We'll discuss what we've learned, OK? So I'll turn you loose, start reading, answer these questions, and then we will discuss them when we're done, OK? You're not on that. Okay. Um, yes. You. By the time you get back to your desk, you will be added. Okay. Yeah. And and if anyone can't see this team, let me know and I will add you. Okay. Shota, you are added. Anyone else? Yo, yeah. There you are. Yoya is added. Anyone else? Fazwa? One second here. There you are. Added. Anyone else? All good?
Tisk tisk. You'll just have to read faster.
a second here. I can help you. I can help you. I can help you. going to send it to you in a message, okay Shota? Come on, come on. Sorry, it's just loading. Here. Oops, no, 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 no. Yeah, there's some baboons. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting.
maybe just a couple more minutes, people, and then we'll talk about what we can, okay? I know you're almost there, but not quite. One more minute. One more minute. All right, so before we kind of jump into this, I want to get a bit of a read on, I guess a bit of a read on your reading. Now, try to be honest with me here just because it will help me. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, how easy was this to read? So one was, oh gosh, this was, you know, super, super easy, whatever. And 10 being, oh my gosh, this was like really, really difficult. How, where did this fall for you? Pretty difficult? Oh, it's, it's easy? In the, or in the middle, sorry, in the middle? Okay, give, give me a number. Five? Five? Six. Six? Just to be different? Okay. Yeah. Definitely, okay. That's good, that's good. It should be, that's about where it should be because it's, it's a bit of a challenging read. It's probably, a, it's probably a first year university text is what it is. So if you can read this, you're doing okay. You know, it should be, there's six, okay. It should be a little challenging for us, which is okay. Um, so that's, that's good. I, I, you know, I'd love to hear that it was super easy for you, but even if we're, you know, even if we have to work at it a little bit, that's okay. I'm, I'm comfortable with that and I'll keep it in mind. Jarek. And I'll keep it in mind. Yeah, you can come in. Um, so, everybody, this is Jarek. Jarek was in um, two of my classes about a year ago or so. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, now Jarek's just doing some university classes here at college, but or at Columbia College. But any any of my students are always welcome back in the room, so he gets to come and go as he pleases. Um, so we're talking here about some of the factors that led to primates walking on two feet. And were you able to get a bit of an understanding about this based on the reading? Did that kind of come through? Why, why would primates that usually run around on four feet, why would they 
start to walk on two feet, why would that be useful to them? Ah, well, well, yeah, wh where were all these grasslands coming from? <laughs> you're, you're right. Okay, let, let me ask you a different question. Well, why, why is walking on two feet useful on a grassland? What's that? Yeah, you need to walk, right? These, these animals would have started out in the trees, right? Remember the Australopithecus we saw with the long arms and the long hands? That guy's swinging around in the trees, but, you know, climate change, sorry, that's where I was trying to go, climate changes had created an environment where the forests are kind of shrinking, right? And these big open grasslands are appearing, right? And suddenly being really good climbing trees, it's not really useful anymore, right? What becomes useful is the ability to walk long distances, right? You've got to be able to, yeah, you've got to be able to walk. Why, why might it be useful to be able to walk long distances? So you might, you might need to find food, right? And food might be further away, right? And you might have to walk kilometers, right? To find your, your next meal. Why else might it be interesting, or interesting? Why else might it be useful to stand on two feet? Millions of years ago. What's that? Yeah, you could see better, right? What might you see? Sure, you might be able to find a food source. These guys aren't hunting just yet, but you might be able to find food, right, if you can stand up. What else might you look for? What's that? Shelter, yeah, you might look for shelter, right? Maybe a tree to stay in in the night or a cave or something like that. What else might you look for? What was it? Danger, yeah, what kind of dangers do you think these animals faced? What, what's that? Drunk. Say it one more time. Drunk. Oh, yeah, yeah, they, well, they, yeah, they, they would face that, right? There'd be, yeah, like they're, you know, like, yeah, tr like try to think about, try to think about Africa millions of years ago, right? You've got all kinds of scary, clawed toothed animals running around and these guys have no weapons okay so homo habilis has his little stone tool but spears haven't been invented yet right you know things to poke haven't been invented fire has not been invented right so these guys have nothing out there and so yeah do you think it'd be useful to see a lion long before you bump into it and say let's go the other way absolutely Right? So as the, as the climate starts to change, it becomes more useful for animals to be up on two feet. Right? They can walk farther. Um, we didn't talk about this, but walking on two feet is much more efficient than walking on four feet. Okay? Here, you can try it. Right? How do we, how do we walk as humans? Right? We kind of cheat. Right? So we lift up our leg like this. And then we kind of use gravity, right? We just kind of fall forward and then catch ourselves, right? And then we do it again. We kind of lean forward and then we let gravity do the rest, right? And we, we kind of, that's what makes it so efficient is all we have to do is just kind of lean forward and then we're just kind of, we're always falling forward and catching ourselves, right? But think about a dog or a cat, right? If they lift up one leg, what happens? What's that? That's, yeah, well, that's kind of it, right? They don't go anywhere. They kind of have to, like, pull themselves along the ground, right? They have to push off with every foot in order to move forward, right? They can't really, they can't really use gravity the way that, that we do. And in, a, in some ways, that makes them super fast, right? They're, that's what makes four-legged creatures way faster than us. But two-legged creatures are very efficient, right? We can walk, well, we're all kind of lazy now after COVID and Netflix, but you know, 
genetically speaking, we can walk for a very long time, right? A very long time. That's what we are engineered to do, right? So, yeah, these, these animals that as the environment changes, as the climate changes, they are, you know, some animals become more successful and some less. And so as grasslands appear, primates appear that are better adapted to it, right? They can walk on two feet, they can walk for a very long time or a much longer time than their four-legged primate ancestors. And they can see danger and food much better, right? And so they have advantages, right? And later on, Homo habilis is gonna invent a tool, right? And then he's gonna have another advantage, right? And so it's going to continue. And so, yeah, climate, changes in climate have something to do with this, right? And as some species become more successful and some species a little bit less, right? Um, Okie dokie. I didn't really time that perfectly, but <laughs> unfortunately sometimes that happens. Um, that's all the time we have for today. So come back tomorrow. We will finish up with prehistory. Uh, and then I think we dive into our first civilization, I think, but I'll have to check. I'm, I, forget what, I forget what we do next. But you can pack it up. Have a nice afternoon. I will see you tomorrow, okay? Same thing, online people. Have a good, um, have a good afternoon, and we'll see you.